What's that? I must have stated a commonly held misconception. He's coming. Ah! Hello, my friends. It's a whole new season. Joy. I know I can make work that is original and true and objectively great. Actually, a lot of fine art is none of those things. The FDA legally allows calorie labels to be off by 20%. Aren't you worried about misleading your customers? Honey, I serve food out of a wagon. Shakespeare wrote Romeo and Juliet after he read an epic poem called Romeo and Juliet. Your boy the Bard is about to do it again! Columbus was an incompetent buffoon who never even set foot in America. <laughs> Hospitals make a ton of money overcharging out-of-network patients. Kinda wish I could just skip the pregnancy and get right to the baby. Oh, I can help with that. Now, let's talk baby names. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here, sir. I love your show. Thank you. Oh, thank you for saying so. I've loved it since I, it was uh, the first couple of videos that were on College Humor. I remember when everyone was, getting, was passing those around and yeah. then it was announced that you got a show. Yeah, we did. We did four original videos for College Humor and then we pitched it, you know, around and, and we uh, took it to True TV and then, it's, yeah, it's just all been going since the, from there. What was the first thing that you ruined? I, I, I don't remember exactly what the, the very first, one first was. thing, and it's still kind of our signature piece, is the one about diamond engagement rings, about how we think that's an age old tradition but it was invented by the De Beers Diamond Cartel in the 30s by an ad campaign. That was just something that I had read in uh, an Atlantic article that had always stuck with me, and I, I started uh, putting it in my comedy. I was a stand-up comic, and I started telling that story on stage, and I noticed that people started reacting to it a little bit more. Uh, you know, they started, they were like, Rather than just laughing, they were like, oh, wow, is that true, really? Like, they would be a little bit more engaged. And I realized I could sort of combine, I've always loved that kind of information, I realized I could sort of combine it with comedy. Uh, and yeah, that brought me here. It makes sense that that would be the kind of foundational video that you built the show off of, considering a lot of what you have to ruin are like misconceptions based off of what has been marketed and advertised yeah. to us over the last like 60 years. I think about your episode about um, sugar and, and fat and right. ruining people's misconceptions about eating, I think it was about eating fat versus sugar, right? Yeah. Well, it was about the, uh, the obsession with low fat food in the 80s was, uh, which, you know, that's what I grew up with. Low fat, low fat, low fat, everywhere was at least partially what was responsible for that was the sugar industry, um, you know, deflecting attention away from the role that dietary sugar has in weight gain and heart disease and putting the attention on fat and saying, that's what we have to cut. Meanwhile, while they were, while food companies were doing that, while they were cutting the fat, they were adding in sugar to make the food taste better, right? Now that's not to say that fat is totally healthy and fat doesn't also lead to, you know, weight gain and heart disease. Our, our expert who was later on the show, this this guy, Dr. Kevin Hall, who who uh, you know studies these issues for the government, you know, uh, told us, "Hey, this is you know, fat does cause weight gain and heart disease, you know, uh, to a similar you know extent to sugar." But the focus on fat, right? This hyper focus on low fat, fat is the demon. You must get fat out. That was uh, in in many ways a marketing creation, and it was certainly not a good way to go about eating healthily. But then I think that this extends all the way to, you know, last week's episode about the suburbs right. and how the, the, the perpetuated myth about of how we perceive ourselves as people that live in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. We neglect the fact that we are the beneficiaries of a decades centuries long, you know, right. systemic racism that has <laughs> has put us in this position that yeah. marketing, advertising and these idea and these myths that we create about ourselves has has allowed right. us to deflect from. Well, that story about redlining, you know, that is just a, such a tiny slice of the history of race in America that we chose to look at there, right? But yeah, the basic story is that in the, you know, 30s and 40s when uh, loan programs were created to make middle class to make home buying available to middle class families, the government the, as a matter of government policy, prevented uh, African American families from uh, from buying from getting home loans and thus having access to that wealth, and and uh, those families were thus 
cut off from this sort of generational wealth accumulation that really shaped our neighborhoods today. I had people after uh, after that segment came out tweet, tweet at me and say, hey, I went and looked up the redlining maps for my neighborhood, and you can still, those lines still determine which are the good and bad neighborhoods today. Have you ever right? been in New Orleans? It's insane, like, yeah. the, the way that the red line works in New Orleans yeah. and cities across the country. And so our point was to show, hey, this thing that we think, you know, we're like, oh, hey, why is, uh, you know, why is the country like this, you know, or, or why is my neighborhood like this? You know, I grew up on Long Island in an extremely white area, and I remember thinking, like, oh, yeah, when I take the Long Island Railroad, like, you know, African-Americans get on the train at a certain stop. You know what I mean? Like, there's, we, I, I had the sense of, okay, white, white people live here and, you know, black people live there. And I didn't really know why. Was, oh, that's just the way things are, you know? And it, uh, you know, it was in large part because these decisions that were made, you know, before any of us were born, long before any of us were born. And we don't always see the effect that they have on us today. Right? No, but and that's what our show's about. But this leads me into a question about your episode that's coming out tomorrow night, which is about conspiracy theories yeah. and ruining conspiracy theories. Because so often conspiracy theories seem to be created so that people can still kind of function in a bubble of that's just the way that it is. Or mm. when they realize how things actually are, their preconceived notions about how things should be doesn't align with how they actually were or yeah. happened. And they create these kind of conspiracy theories yeah that's i mean that's a topic we've really wanted to do for a while conspiracy theories are um fascinating to me um because they're sort of like this weird uh perversion of the kind of uh, of like the kind of like investigative thought process that i actually like to go through and they're actually very pernicious you know um but yeah, they're, it's, they're the result of this sort of like accumulation of biases in the brain and our reasoning process where, as we go into on the show, when major, when major events happen and they're random, right, um, we have a really hard time with that because we are sort of designed walking around, you know, evolutionarily to put together cause and effect. That's part of what makes us a successful species. You know, you, you, uh, you know, you're walking around in the jungle and, and, you know, you see your leaves rustle and then a tiger jumps out and kills you and you're like, okay, I think I put two and two together, right? Well, unless you're dead, you know, but if you, if you survived, you, you, you know, figure that out, right? So if something, when things happen totally randomly, that's, that's concerning to us, right? Um, and so that's, you know, when you see uh, a lot of the biggest conspiracy theories today are around, like, you know, when that plane went missing, you know, the, the Malaysian uh, Airlines plane went missing, um, and people said, it can't just be random chance. It can't just be that the plane crashed and or that, you know, uh, our technology wasn't good enough. There must be something more to it, right? That's what, that's what people say. Or when JFK was assassinated, right? It was such a monumental event that people couldn't believe that it, that it could just be caused by one dude going crazy with a gun, you know, that there, it must have been the result of bigger, of bigger forces, right? Um, and so it's like this, uh, you know, and that's, and that's almost like the least pernicious forms of conspiracy theories. You know, it gets, it gets more, you know, the further people go down the rabbit hole into that, into that type of thinking, the, uh, uh the worse it gets. You know, we also go into, uh, talking about the effect that these, you know, having conspiracy, uh, it, believing conspiracy theories has on the mind and on society, you know, like people who, uh, believe in conspiracy theories are less likely to vote, they're less likely to believe medical advice, you know, uh, so it is, you know, and it's a, it's an issue that I think we, we can see today, you know. What do you think about, when it comes to conspiracy theories, what do you think about when the events are no longer random, but the conspiracy theories are still being built up around them? I think in relation to, I think of someone like Alex Jones, right? right. Who consistently builds up new conspiracy, or even the same old conspiracy theories about uh, mass shootings, for instance. And mm -hmm. it's like, these are, at the, we've reached a point where we can explain sort of how this happens, what the patterns are that make something like this happens, both policy-wise and both personality-wise, yeah. you know? And, and they're still trying to create some sort of craft, some sort of, you know, conspiracy about right. false flag actors, all these things. I hate to yeah. go too deep down this. It's tragic that anybody does this. But what do you yeah. think about that? I mean, I, I, I think it, uh, uh, you know, I find it deeply disturbing um, that people do that. I, I don't have, honestly, in my own research, I, I can't explain that 
you know, flavor of conspiratorial thinking in the same way, you know, like the simple principle of, hey, we have proportionality bias, so a big event, we require a big cause. That, I, that is a sort of the simple version, and I can say that's, you know, that's why this happens. As far as, you know, that sort of thinking goes, it, it uh, you know, I think there's so much going on that, that, you know, you can't really say, oh, it's because of this bias in the brain. You know, I think it has to do with, you know, uh, our intense you know, polarization as a culture is, is part of what leads to that kind of thinking. And, um, uh, you know, there's also a, you know, long history of, of sort of, uh, you know, conspiratorial thinking in America that that's, it's sort of like drawing on a whole different strain of the culture, right. you know, that's, that's always, that's always been there. You know, it's like the John Bircher's like, you know, uh, uh, 40 years ago, you know, there's like, you can draw a straight line today to probably Alex Jones, but I, uh, yeah, it's, it, it, you know, that's the sort of, that's the biggest version of this, you know, and we, we sort of break it down and try to look at like, okay, these are the sort of simple everyday versions and here's why they happen, you know? Yeah. Well, so much of your show is breaking down conspiracy theories, even if you're not actually breaking down conspiracy theories themselves. This is the interesting part, is that we, um, uh, and this is the conclusion that we come to in the episode, because to say, when we're criticizing conspiracy theories and conspiracy theorists, right, that's not to say that there is no such thing as actual conspiracies. Of course there are conspiracies that have happened. Or right? are happening currently, right yeah. now, in this minute. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, that, and, and the things that we cover on the show are conspiracies, right? The De Beers Corporation conspired to inject the diamond engagement ring into the culture for their own benefit. They literally got together in a boardroom with an ad agency and said, what's the best way that we can do it, right? right. The um, government conspired to keep African Americans out yeah, of well, like yeah, raising exactly. wealth through the suburbs. Yeah. And then there's even stuff that's actually happened that seems crazy. You know, there's like MK Ultra, like which was the, you know, the CIA mind control experiments, which sound like a conspiracy theory, but in fact they are a factual conspiracy that actually happened. Those things are all real, right? Um, the difference with, you know, so why, why do we criticize conspiracy theorists? Well, these are people who are talking about conspiracies that we don't know if they, uh, we never find proof that these things happened, right? We, we never get the mainstream evidence that, you know, if you are clearly thinking, you would require to have proof that such a thing occurred, right? It's just there's, there's theories on theories on theories. So actual conspiracies are uncovered by journalists, by historians, you know, people like that. Um, and we talk about on the show, like, you know, an everyday conspiracy is like, hey, there's a guy running a union who's misappropriating funds, as uncovered in the LA Times, you know, or, uh, or you know, a, uh, you know, payoffs to a politician, or, a, uh, you know, a corporation that's bribing, et cetera, that, that sort of thing. Those sort of things are uncovered in your local paper every day. The, the messed up part about conspiracy theories is that people who really get into them tend to stop believing the newspaper, right? Or the, or the news, or, you know, the, those... those tend, tend to stop believing those that are actually uncovering the exactly. conspiracy. Exactly. Yeah. That, that, that's the really ironic part, is that you end up less able to actually see the real conspiracies that are in front of you because your sense of the world becomes so much in flux. Oh, anything could be true. It's all... Well, they could, they could have planted that. You know, you end up with that sort of thinking. And so you never end up like knowing anything, you know, you, and you never end up actually knowing the truth about real conspiracies that are happening on a daily basis, right? Was your episode at all influenced by, off of, uh, you know, last year and, and, and the election? It seemed like there was a, uh, a strong feeling during the election of a, uh, of a larger group of people than we've ever seen, sort of having that feeling of just sort of like, what, what is there to believe in anything that you brought up? They had some sort of weird conspiracy theory to yeah. throw at you, you know? I mean, I've, uh, so I've always been, um, uh, interested in conspiracy theories my whole life. It's just always been a subject of fascination for me. Um, but I think in the last two years, we all saw the mainstreaming of conspiracy theories. And yeah, we actually pitched the idea to, you know, uh, uh, to the network our very first year. Like, what's, what have you do an episode on conspiracy theories? And they were like, ah, I don't know. Let's do something a little more general that, like, you know, applies to more people. You know, it's a little niche. Uh, this year they didn't think it was niche when we pitched it, right? <laughs> so that's the, that's the difference. And yeah, I, you know, you see it in, 
you see it in small ways, you know, um, uh, all over the place. You know, just, just e you know, even people who, you know, were were formerly very hard headed ha will have, you know, even myself. You know, I notice it happening to myself. We have a little bit more of a tendency to, you know, connect dots where there aren't dots to be connected, or to worry that, you know, the wool is being pulled over and uh, over your eyes. You know, and you should always be skeptical and critical, but you also need to be wary of. Going going over this precipice where you can, you know, at the end of that road, you believe nothing and no one, you know, and you and you have no firm rock to ever stand upon, because that really reduces your power in the world when that happens, you know? Yeah, I want to go back to, you, so you, you make the first one, you make four more, you pitch the show. Was there ever a sense to you, like, I mean, this was a bit that you did in your stand-up. Yeah. You, were you always kind of trying to uncover myths or, or, or truths? Or did you like pitch the show, you guys get booked and you're like, shit, I gotta come up with like a bunch of different <laughs> things to ruin? How are we gonna do? It's no. different than coming up with just like a plot for a sitcom over yeah. and over again. Well, I, I mean, honestly, I would rather come up with topics for our show than plots for a sitcom. True. Like I, I'm more stressed out by coming up with, with plots for a sitcom because that's, that's who I am, you know? Um, I've always been interested in this type of story, you know, um, and in this type of topic. Um, I've always been, you know, very, very critical and, and you know, very skeptical of, of the world around me, you know. Um, uh, uh, like, I remember, um, just for example, this is 10 years ago, but uh, I was in a sketch group and we had uh, booked a private plane to shoot a scene in, right? Like, just, it was on the ground. It wasn't flying. We were just on the ground. Um, and we just had to shoot in there for, for half a day, you know, and we got, we found this, you know, uh, a pilot who gave us, uh, who, you know, who uh, did us a favor, right? And so he had to hang around the plane. And so after we shoot the scene, we're talking to the pilot, and one of the guys in the group says, hey, why do you have to turn your uh, your cell phone off when the plane takes off? You know, why do you have to turn off your, your Game Boy or whatever? How, uh, does that really interfere with the plane? And the pilot says, Oh, uh, well, you, well, you know, it, uh, it has been shown that it could uh, affect the takeoff of the plane. I think we'd all want to be safe, wouldn't you? You know, I, I certainly. So why don't we take every precaution and turn those things off? And to the pilot, I say, oh, I don't know. I heard, uh, I heard, I I read an article that said that there's no way it could interfere with the plane, you know? And the, and the other guys in my group were like, what the hell are you doing? You're questioning the pilot, like, to his face? Like, you're just a 23-year-old dude, you know? Like, what do you know about this, you know? Um, and so that is that is very much like the way I've always been, you know, where, where I've always, like, you know, oh, that sounds a little fishy to me. Let me go look into it a little bit more, you know? And every time I, I saw one of these stories, like the Diamond Ring story, or like, the, say, the story about how, you know, the auto industry sort of created the idea of jaywalking in order to keep people out of the street, you know, the, the, or these sorts of... <laughs> that's just from a different episode, right? Um, I, the, they, they always stuck with me, you know, and they would always... They would always really like sort of you know get me a little worked up and and be fun to think about you know and and so I just always sort of casually collected them you know and so creating the show was really a matter of saying okay how can I give that same feeling to the audience over and over again here's here's a feeling I've always loved when I read a piece of nonfiction how do I combine that with comedy and give that to the audience over and over again so I had a bunch um, stored up you know um, I had a couple dozen now. You know, I sort of we sort of run through all the ones that I knew right off the top of my head that I, you know we 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 ran through my cocktail party conversation right. Um, so uh, you know we have a research yeah, team. What do you that. do in cocktail party conversation? <laughs> you like you have to save everything for the show. I actually talk a lot less than I used to at at <laughs> parties because I do it professionally now. Like I used to be much more annoying at parties because I would go off about someone be talking about something. The same oh, thing. I read an article about that. I read an article. You're know, like, oh god, here he goes. Um, and now I don't do that because it's what I do professionally, and I sort of let other people talk a little bit more and try to listen. <laughs> so what is the process with you and the writers then outside of, I mean, after having, you know, run out of these things, how do you guys research some topics? Does everyone have, sure. like, is it like standard, like everyone has a pitch meeting and yeah. they bring topics? Yeah, we have a Monday morning pitch meeting. Um, we have a uh, writing team and a research team um, uh, and uh, who, who, you know, work hand in hand. So we've got comedy writers and we have researchers from the world of, you know, journalists and, and people from the world of academia, stuff like that, very smart folks. Um, and yeah, it's just open pitch, you know, uh, people pitch stuff. If the room goes, oh, wow, that's great. Like, I want to know more about this. This is clicking for us, you know. Then we go out and we run it down more. You know, we, we go, you know, push on it and, 
and you know, uh, uh, you know, test it and make sure it, it really holds up, you know. Um, and uh, uh, you know, if it does, and there there are definitely ones that don't. We've killed, you know, we kill probably about half of our stories that get to that stage because we look into it and when we say, well, scholars are actually divided on this. Like this is kind of a fringe theory. Not everyone, you know, believes this, etc. Um, you know, we want to do this story for our, for our, we have a Halloween episode coming up, and we want to do this story about how witches, about how the concept of witches was actually just sort of like uh, on the English islands, like a folk religion, you know, that was like sort of like the medicine woman in town, you know, uh, that's all a witch was, but then it like was competed with the Catholic Church, you know, for attention. And so the Catholic Church demonized witches, and that's where we have the idea of witches today. And we're like, man, that's a great story. Oh, that sounds so good. Oh, that would be so fun. There are all these fun little details about it, you know. Um, oh, we'd love to break that down over the course of the episode. And then after looking into it for a week, we said, yeah, we're not sure enough that this is true. You know, like this is one historian, and this is the story that they told, and their book is good. But you have other historians saying, you know, this is just one way of looking at it. Like, this is just one little piece of the puzzle, and it doesn't really, if you look at the whole historical idea, you know, like, it, it would, you know, we eventually said we would be doing a disservice if we, uh, if we put that story out there, you know, as being, hey, here's the origin of witches, you know? So we, so we had to kill it. And we have instead, you know, three other really awesome Halloween stories. But um, uh, so we do that. We run it down. And uh, after that, we just sort of put, try to put the argument in order and, and uh, write the scripts and yeah take it from there uh i want to get some questions from the audience in just a minute but i, I want to talk to you about another project that you're involved in that is a show that i love dearly as well as yours which is bojack horseman oh yeah bojack horseman yeah how did you get involved playing a ryan seacrest type on <laughs> and bradley horseman? hitler smith right um, yeah i uh uh it, it's really funny actually one of the guys from the sketch group that i mentioned earlier is this group called old english um of course. Remember oh, old you remember English? Old English? Yes, oh. I remember the uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's sketch that Old English did. I was did. in that sketch. Were you? I'm yes, sorry I was, that I no, forgot. No, it's okay. The, I was the backup singer. I wasn't the main guy. I was. I was in the. I was in the background. I was playing the guitar in it. Um, What's the Jesse? Jesse? Some, is that the guy's name? What's the guy's name? Uh, the in? guy in the well, here's uh, this in is, Old English. This, that's this, on. This perfectly leads into it. Raphael Bob Waxberg is the guy um, in the front of that of that video, um, and he is the creator of BoJack Horseman. Um, so he's one of my old, so, so we were in that sketch group together. Uh, and he actually introduced me to my girlfriend, Lisa Hanawalt, who is the character designer and uh, production designer of BoJack Horseman. So she is, she's Shout a cartoonist. Out to Lisa. Shout out to Lisa. She is a cartoonist. And uh, she does all of the art. You know, if you're looking at BoJack Horseman, you're looking at her drawings, you know, which are then animated by the whole team there. Um, so it's a kind of a family show, you know, and they just brought me in to uh, uh, do a couple voices and, and a couple of those characters stuck. And, you know, it's a blast. Voice acting is so much fun. You just go in and, and you're in, you're out. You do some funny voices. And, and yeah, it's so much fun. I love, I love that show so much. I love doing it. I had no idea that you were, your old sketch group was Old English. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I remember the Deep Blue Something video and a couple others, mainly just the Breakfast at Tiffany's Deep Blue Something yeah. one, though. We, we were very early, very early internet, web, yeah. you know, web video content. We, you know, we were... Super Deluxe, right? As a, we, yeah. we were on Super Deluxe, the original incarnation of the website Super Deluxe, yeah, which was... Uh, 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 Turner website, and um, then, uh, yeah, but even before that, we, we were putting videos up pre-YouTube, like we were compressing our own QuickTime videos, and I was the guy doing all the posts, I compressed all the videos. So did myself. I, where I work. I worked, oh, really? I worked at a comedy website, and I had to <laughs> compress all the videos. <laughs> yeah. Which website? Uh, it was called 23.6, it was like a comedy oh, news yeah, I remember, I remember 23.6, yeah. yeah. 23, uh, what were the other ones? Adam Films, you want to talk yeah. about? <laughs> Let's, I guess we're just going to run through the names of some 2006 era <laughs> web comedy websites. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's get some questions from the audience. Who is a quite right here? Sure. So you're the host of your show, but from my understanding, you're also a producer mm -hmm. and the creator. How do you fulfill those multiple caps? Uh, it's it's interesting. I um, it's a really good question. Um, you know, uh, during the first year, it was just by pushing myself incredibly hard and working incredibly. You know, working 18-hour days on the on the show. Um, and, uh, you know, now I, uh, I have other producers. I have, uh, a, an amazing executive producer, John Wolf, who helps me sort of with the day to day and, you know, like does a lot of the important producing jobs, you know, the casting of the talent and the overseeing the final mix and the color correction and all these different elements, you know, um, but, uh, you know, the really being a producer in that role is the, you know, 
the main part of the job description is having ultimate responsibility for how the show looks and what it has to say and what you know what comes out of it. Um, so uh, you know that's just uh, all I do is I just always have my sort of creative eye turned on to it at all times. You know, even when I'm you know just acting on set, I'm also like sort of looking at the props and like looking at the you know uh, like looking at everyone's performance and the camera angle and just sort of seeing like okay, is this really the best it can be? And and you know how can we how can we make tomorrow go a little bit smoother if today was going a little bit rough? You know, um, it's challenging because I'm constantly switching between the different jobs. You know, like I'm I'm uh, you know I'm writing and then I'm performing and then I have to go watch a cut and then I have to do this or that. But um, yeah, you just sort of you just sort of get get used to it and try to try to not uh, go crazy with all the work. <laughs> Talk to me about the character, Adam, sure. versus versus you. Like, how did you? This is clearly like a, a caricature of. Of you yeah. or this idea of the person that you would be if you were ruining everything for everybody. <laughs> yes. Where did this come from? Well, uh, the character came from, um, it's a little bit uh, like a younger version of myself, you know. Um, uh, when I was younger in my, you know, in college, in my 20s, you know, I was, like I said, constantly, you know, bringing up things people didn't want to know, like annoying people at parties with facts that they, did, that they didn't ask for, you know. Um, and fun. <laughs> yeah, I was a fun guy. I was a really good, I, I was a great time. Um, it makes sense that now you have a girlfriend. No. Yeah, 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 no, exactly, exactly. Well, on the show, I'm, I'm lonely, right? I don't have any friends. I don't have, a, I don't have a girlfriend or anything like that. That is how I felt, you know, in my, in my 20s. Um, now I'm much more socially adjusted, and, and yeah, I have a girlfriend, and, and I and I know to hang back a little bit at, at a dinner party. But it's it's sort of like you know, yeah, it's it's based on my sort of like worst qualities in a way. You know, I, I often compare it like you know, uh, you know, think of like Larry David on Curb Your Enthusiasm. You know, you're like, well, you know, in real life he's like that, but he's not really like that. You know, and so it's a little bit of that same. Uh, self-parody um, and then a lot of it just came out of like what would be funny you know because there's that room to script it and to play a character okay what would you know how would it be funny for the for the character to act so it really grew just in the writer's room you know step by step okay what what is Adam's room gonna look like you know what is his relationship with his family like etc and sort of sort of building out that world you know well, what about like the sort of sharpening the character visually because I mean the way that he dresses his hair it's all I, I, I hesitate to use the words it's very sharp because yeah. that into in something else, but it actually is actually like physically sharp almost, <laughs> you know, like his hair. Yeah, looks yeah, It's like yeah. the point of a knife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and in real life, it's a little... I mean, well, the, right. First of all, this is what I'm able to do myself, right? Um, you know, like this is this is me in my hotel room with a blow dryer as opposed to this. This takes, you know, a uh, hair team uh, close to half an hour to do, like specifically. They like tease it and build There's like a little, there's a whole little scaffold of like hair under here that they put over. Like it's like a little, you know, and then, and then my hairstylist Marissa comes up in between shots and goes, oh, how's my baby doing? And like... <laughs> Touches, touch. Clear if she's referring to you or the hair. She's talking about the hair. Yeah, she's <laughs> specifically talking about the hair. So it's really funny because people always ask, "Hey, what product do you use in your hair?" That's like a common question I get on Twitter or, or you know, in live chats and stuff like that. As though there were a single, as though you could buy one product <laughs> that that did this. This is a. This takes. This is you know. You talk about um, you know the the unrealistic body image that the media gives gives people. I'm giving people unrealistic hair image because this can only be done with a full team of professionals you know who come and touch it up every day it's not possible to do this on your own i couldn't do this to myself you know have you ever tried i've not i've You've not had, tried like a press day we're like oh, i'll just do it don't worry i'll go <laughs> i'll go in character this is again this is about the this is about the best this is about the best i can do and if you want to know what the one product is a blow dryer a lot of men are too nervous to use a blow dryer they think they don't deserve to use a blow dryer or that one of their friends from college is gonna come in and yell at them if they like, what are you doing? You know, oh, you think you're so handsome? A blow dryer gets you the volume. You think you're John Travolta? Yeah. You're not John Travolta. <laughs> yeah, get out of here with blow dryer. No, you can use a blow dryer, guys. You should use one. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so it, uh, you know, a lot of it was just, so <laughs> what I'll say is the way I dress on the show was the way, kind of the way I aspired to dress like when we created the show three or four years ago, you know, um, uh, where I was like sort of into a little bit like traditional menswear and stuff like that, and and you know like like jacket pants combinations, etc. Um, and then just turned a, up a little bit, you know, turned up a little bit much, you know, uh, to get a little bit more of a stylized effect and to be a little bit, you know, 
a little bit nerdy in how fancy it is of an outfit, you know, is a, is a little bit the idea. Like, it's a little bit overdone, you know, it's a little bit too bright. Um, and uh, that was just developed in collaboration with um, my uh, amazing wardrobe designer, Alicia Silverstein, who's who's great. And we've sort of developed together, like, you know, oh, the character would wear this, but not wear that, you know. Um, and so it just, you know, a lot of those choices, you know, they just come out of, Cre uh, out of working on the show and refining the, you know, refining all the different things that we're doing. So if you look at the first couple episodes, I'm almost dressed a little bit more drably, you know, and my hair is not quite as high, right? And then over the course of the first year of episodes that we did, my hair gets super, super tall and like a cone almost, and my outfits get very, very bright, and then we tone it all down a little bit because we realized we, it was a little bit too much. If you look at like episode four of the show, my hair is like way too high, <laughs> and we realized we had to take it down. So you so you know you you feel it out you know we over the first you know over the first year uh, in order to to you know find find what you want it to be. Yeah. Next question. Hi, um, my question is, what is one of your favorite ruins from Adam Ruins Everything? Oh, geez. Um, uh, oh man, I should be more prepared for that question uh, because <laughs> I do get it a lot. Um, let's see. I, you know, I always say first of all. Uh, the one that really surprised me the most was the one about uh, the female hymen, which is from our sex episode. I, I know those gets a little bit of a laugh. It's because <laughs> there's a child whose ears are being covered in the back. <laughs> it's okay. You can know these things. It's sex ed. Everyone needs to know. Uh, that topic, I won't go into, you know, what it, what it uh, is specifically, but, um, you know, in... I didn't know that until it was pitched to me in the writer's room. And I was shocked by that. I was like, wait a second. I've been wrong my whole life about how this basic piece of anatomy works. You know, you're told that it's like, you know, this like this barrier and then you're you can, you know, you can tell whether or not someone's a virgin based on it, you know. And it's not true at all. Neither of those things are true in the slightest, but that was that was just what we are told, you know, not even just in school, just that's the cultural, you know what I mean? And I was like, I've been wrong about this basic piece of the human body my whole life. We're all going around, that's like, that's like if we were all going around, you know, saying that everyone had three nostrils or something. Like, it's, all you have to do is like, take a look. It's not true, you know? <laughs> I mean, you gotta do more than that. But you know, it's like, <laughs> It's, it's a little bit more complicated. It's a little more hidden than other body parts. But, um, you know, like, it's, I was like, I'm sh I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. So, you know, that's how I feel. Uh, you know, what, I know the topics are working for me when I am as shocked as the audience is. When I'm like, can you, what? You know, like that. If I'm doing that, then then the audience is going to do that too. And so that so those are the ones that, that uh that work really, really well for me. Um, Do you ever worry, or have you guys ever talked about this in the last season, the season before, that you're a dude and you're sort of explaining all these things, mm -hmm. and that there is, to a sense, a degree of your character kind of popping up and going like, actually, which has sort of come to represent in many ways, like on Twitter and other social media, the idea of you're, mansplaining. You, I was about to say, you're, I was like, wait, I mean, just just say mansplaining. Well, just get to the word mansplaining. I know. I mean, I watch a show, and the show in yeah. no way is like, you know, is your character actually like that or offensive? And right. It's very very much a, uh, I would, I don't want to, I hesitate to, say, hesitate to say a liberal show, but in no way are you like mansplaining in sexist ways. But have yeah. you guys had that conversation about you as a male character explaining all these things? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why in that segment, right, that I was just talking about, about, about the female anatomy, I don't go and interrupt and tell Emily, look, let me tell you everything you need to know about the female hymen. She tells me, she tells my character, right? Um, uh, that, and so we do that, we do that periodically, you know, in our, in our prison episode, I don't pop into a prison and start telling them how things are, you know, it's like we go to a prison and one of the, you know, one of the, uh, people in there is the person like explaining everything to us because, Hey, let me tell you how this place is. Right. You know, let me suburbs episode last week, you brought in the woman from the New York times, Nicole. Well, that, uh, well, yeah. that, yeah, and that, yeah, Nicole Hannah Jones, who's an incredible journalist. Um, but, but she, yeah, uh, you know, that's something that we do on every episode as well, where there's always the part where I can no longer explain and we need to bring in the expert, right? Because we're getting into the part that's so complicated or so difficult to believe um, or so intense that we need, you know, we need the expert's explanation. Um, but, uh, you know, there are also episodes where, you know, it was important for us to show that uh, the, you know, the character isn't the font of all knowledge. He's not some omniscient 
guy, right, who, you know, knows everything and is going to tell you the fact about everything, right? Um, the, uh, the character, like me myself, is just a curious person who, you know, reads a lot, right, and listens to a lot of podcasts and has picked up a lot of information and is very curious, right? But that process of curiosity doesn't stop, you know, with the, uh, you know, with the show. Um, so it's important to us to show moments where Adam is learning from other people, right? Uh, it's funny how I talk about the character in the third person, but... Um, uh, you, you know, where, where he's the person being the recipient of the information and where he is the person who's incorrect, you know. Um, that's a really critical, that's a really, really critical part of the show to us, you know. Sometimes you have corrections on the show, right? Yeah, where, we have. And you specifically have, I mean, I don't know if you specifically do this for a reason, but you have a woman uh, em employee come and correct you on everything. Oh, yeah, yeah, em em Emily Axford, yeah. She's not, an she's not an employee. She would be very mad if we portrayed her. She's an actress? As an employee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's Sorry. a, <laughs> no, no, that's fine. She, well, she's a friend of mine and she plays my friend on the show, my friend. And Emily and and uh, uh, and yeah, she's uh, uh, yeah she and we uh, we do um, we do employ her as an actor, but she's a, f a freelancer in that moment, I suppose. Not really, you know. She's not uh, she has not a four hundred one k or anything. Um, but uh, yeah, she uh, uh, comes on to uh, we have an episode called Emily ruins Adam ruins everything, and that's her turning it back around on me. And one of the things that she does is yeah, we did a segment that we've been wanting to do for a while where we corrected mistakes that we made. Uh, previously throughout the show, um, and we had, you know, we had her, we had her do it because we thought that would be fun. But also, you know, we don't again want people to think that we think that the show is portraying perfect knowledge all the time, you know, because we are humans like anybody else. You know, it would be intellectually dishonest to say, hey, everything we say is true because we say it, and we expect you to believe us no matter what we say because we are geniuses, you know. Um, the truth is that we are, you know, a dozen people who are making, you know, this year we made 16 episodes in 10 months, so, you know, we're, we're researching them, and, and you know, we, we try very, very hard. We fact-check everything. We run everything by our experts, you know, um, and uh, uh, we work very hard to get it right. Occasionally, you know, we do get things wrong, or we afterwards we say, hey, we could have communicated that idea a little bit better, et cetera, um, and so by having those periodic moments where we go in and uh, uh, correct those errors, that is how we feel we build trust with the audience because we're being you know, straightforward about our methods and about our process. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, uh, getting back to the point you made earlier, uh, Look, I wanted to make the, you know, I want to make this show. I like sharing this kind of information. Um, I can't help but be a white man because that's who I am. You know what I mean? So what we try to do on the show is to give, you know, is try to create as many moments as possible um, uh, where, you know, I am learning something from somebody else and where other people's voices are represented and come through. Um, yeah. And I don't, I don't, I don't think that you guys did that at all. It was more a question of how you, if you initially addressed it, and how you ended up making was, sure that the show didn't do that. It was something that we were, yeah, it was something that we were very, that we were very sure about, you know, that we were very aware of, and that we wanted to uh, be sure to be careful of as we went through. You know, the, you are very, you do it very well. Thank you, thank you for saying so. You are so good at being a, a, a white man. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> From one white man to another, I you're just so to, aware. You're so I, woke, baby. Oh God! I, no, no, I just, I just try to be. I try to, I try to be a, I try to be a good boy and try, I try to do the, I try to do the right thing, and that's all, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one more question, right here. Hi. Um, I was wondering what impact do you want your show to have on people's mind, like to change how they think and things like that. Thanks for asking. Um, I really, you know, a. For us, it's about sharing the the individual pieces of information. You know, I, I hope that people take that information and learn it and are able to, you know, use it for good in their lives, right? Uh, beyond that, I hope that we help encourage folks who watch the show to think more critically about the world around them and to, you know, uh, uh, open their mind up to this way of thinking. You know, if we can get people to be in the habit of not just asking questions and being skeptical, but going and like looking at the sources, you know, saying, hey, where did this information come from? Breaking it down, saying, you know, uh, okay, if, you know, maybe uh, if information from this source is good, information from that source is not, you know, and, and sort of, uh, you know, thinking more rigorously about how do I take in information and, and how do I, you know, go through the world in a way that's, that's mindful and is going to like help me learn more about it. You know that's that's our main that's our main hope. You know, um, and we try to stand for those 
values, you know, that it is always, you know, something we repeat on the show, it's always better to know the truth. There is a truth out there, and you can know it, and it's always better to know it, and sometimes you're going to be wrong, but you can correct that mistake, you know. Those sort of basic values are what we're, what we're trying to, to get across and, and stand for as best we can. Yeah. Do you think we've reached some sort of point culturally where people are more used to asking questions than they are in, into finding the actual truth and doing the research it takes to ask questions? I would argue that 20, 30 years ago, people asked less questions because certain preconceived notions about their identity, about their culture, about their country hadn't sort of been shattered in some ways. And yeah. now people are kind of forced to ask questions but not grapple with the actual work it takes to find the <laughs> answers. I'm serious. Uh... That's a really good question. Um, I would say that people are more open to asking questions now um, than they were. You know, if you look at, you know, all you have to do is is look at media from the 1950s and see that people were less questioning of what their government told them then. You media know? from 1995, you yeah. can see that, or yeah. from 2000. Three. <laughs> yeah. Well, it cha you know it, it it changes. You know what I mean? I mean there there are all these big moments that that um, you know changed how people think about these issues culturally. You know, like Watergate was a big moment that that made people more skeptical of the government, right? Um, uh, just as an example, uh, and the Vietnam War and stuff like that. But then, yeah, then the Iraq War was another one of those moments that that made people. And that's just talking about people's relationship yeah. to the government, right? Um, as far as whether people are less, so I think, yes, people do ask more questions and they think more skeptically. In terms of whether they're less, uh, less likely to go do the research on their own, I'm not sure about that. I, I, I think they might be more likely um, than, they, than they used to be because there are so many more sources of information out there for us. You know, I think people are... Um, uh, you know, it's so much easier now to pop open Google rather than look. People, people will often, you know, talk crap about Google or Wikipedia and say, ah, people just look up and believe whatever they want, you know. But th they forget that before that, in order to learn anything, you had to go to the library, you know, and that's hard to do. It's hard. It it's three hours out of your day to go to the library and learn something, right? Um, it's it's tough, and so. Um, the, uh, you know, so I, I think that people were more likely to go along and coast, you know, whereas now people at least will punch it into Google, right, and look for something. Now, the downside of that is that we're in this age where I think the thing that really, that really makes today different is that there's so many sources of information, and they've all been leveled. They're all on the same level, you know what I mean? Um, uh, you know, all the, you know, your, your friend on Facebook has as much power as Ted Koppel does right now in terms of what you see and understand, right? And that's good in many ways because there's many voices that we didn't get to hear before that now we get to hear, right? And it's bad in many ways because our sources, I think the biggest thing that's changed now is that our sources of authority in media have lost their authority, right? The, the nightly news, the newspaper, you know, um, the, the experts, et cetera, right? Um, they no longer seem any smarter than anyone else to us, you know? And that is a, a bummer because some of those, not all of them, but some of them really did have better methods for finding information. You know, the traditional newspaper newsroom, for all the problems that traditional newspapers had, those, you know, that newsroom culture that, you know, was at its, you know, highest flourish in like the, the late 90s was so good at finding out information. And that whole culture is dying now, you know, and people don't take it as seriously. You know, people take, you know, something from the New York Times as seriously as, you know, but people will put the New York Times and Breitbart in the same category. You know, many I mean? arguments last year where you'd show someone something from the New York Times and they'd be like, but I saw this other thing, and you'd be like, no, but this is from the New York Times. Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't care. Well, then also the New York Times has been pulled in a more, uh, you know, they, they have been pulled in a more polarized direction as well. And so the quality of the work has actually gone down a, a, to a certain extent, you know. So, um, my, so, so we're in a point of right now, I think, sort of massive media disruption, you know, where um, and at first that seemed good, right? Because we're now have access to voices we didn't have before. But I think now we're seeing the downside of it, where where you know no one knows what they can trust. No one knows uh, what they can uh, you know if they hear say, how do I know if this is good information or not? Ah, they're all just full of it. You know, that's how we feel about everything. So um, uh, I hope that 
as we sort of rise from the ashes of our current chaotic moment, we'll start to build new sources of authority that we can all that we can all trust, and that you know we're that we're in a chaotic period, and that we're going to come out the other end. What we what we're trying to do on our show, and look, I'm just some comedian, you know, but what we try to do on our show is by being really honest about here's how we re, here's how we do our show, you know, um, really straightforward about it. Um, that we can build up a little bit of trust in ourselves and in our own process and sort of remind folks, hey, this is how you filter through good information and bad information so that we can sort of be a little bit of a, of a rock in a, in a chaotic time for folks. I do wonder if we're in the midst of an evolutionary period. I mean, we're, we're always in the midst of an evolutionary period, but specifically in regards to how we consume and process information, mm -hmm. you know? If the authority has gone in terms of who we can take for granted in terms of believing, we then have to do our own research into what we're looking at. So I wonder if people are start, are gonna start realizing in the next few years that they have to do that, that they have to actually check their sources when they read things. Yeah, I, 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 I hope so, I, and I, I think they will. Um, one of the problems is that uh, you can go too far with, hey, do your own research. That's a that's, that's a what I mean. That's a piece of advice that people give. A lot. Hey, you know, don't believe everything here. Do your own research. You know, okay, now, Infowars Yeah, yeah, exactly. That was a really good piece of advice in the '90s when you know there was a very strict mass media. You know, that only had ten outlets, and you know, you should think for yourself and question what you hear. You know. Um, the reality is that you is that we can't do our own research about everything, right? You can't know <laughs> whether you know Russia hacked the election or whether uh, let's take a better example. You know, you can't go find out information about the political situation in North Korea by yourself. You know, you can't actually do your own research on that. You have to at at, at the end of the day be picking and choosing between the authorities that you that you trust. And that's the more important thing to do is say, okay, this is a this is a trustworthy source. This is not a trustworthy source. You know, and then I'm going to put place trust in them, right? At some point, if you want to know about the world, you have to place trust in some other source of information. It can be tentative trust, it can be trust and verify, you know, it can be, hey, I'm gonna trust them until they mess up, or I'm going to read this and know that they have a little bit of a bias in this way or that, but I can trust this part of the information. But you do have to have trust in some way. And so if you, that's the problem with conspiratorial thinking, is if you end up in a place where you trust nothing and no one, you have no way to learn anything about the world around you, because except what you literally are seeing with your own two eyes. Minute by minute. Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay. There's a yeah. I'm this on, is this is real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm on I'm on I'm on Eighth Avenue. Okay, that's where I know that you know or whatever. Are we on Eighth Avenue? I'm not sure. I no, actually we're not. <laughs> oh oh god, Fourth Street. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, they, I, 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 I came here in a cab. I don't, wasn't paying attention. <laughs> uh, Adam, it's been a pleasure talking to you, man. Uh, Adam Ruins Conspiracy Theories from Adam Ruins Everything is on tomorrow night. Tomorrow on night, True TV. What 10 p.m. 10, 10 p.m. on True you, TV. You've got just a few more episodes left of the season, right? Yeah, we do. We so do. we've got like four, four or five episodes? Something like that. Something yeah. like that. And then how can people go back and check out uh, previous episodes? Uh, they are, well, we have, we have, uh, you know, we have little clips online. Um, you can also watch full episodes on iTunes, Amazon, Google Play, the cool. Watch True TV app. Cool. We have our we have our own app where you can watch the episodes and they're rerun all the time. They're on demand is a good way to watch it. You got the on demand button on your cable box. But tune into Adam Ruins Conspiracies tomorrow night on True TV. Watch at 10 it at 10 p.m. Yes. Adam Conover, everybody, give Thank it up. Thank you guys. Thank you guys so much. Wonderful.